Welcome to the teaching ministry of Lifetime Guarantee. We've been presenting the message of freedom and grace in Christ for over 30 years. The legacy of the ministry spans every state in the U.S. and reaches into over 140 countries internationally. We're glad that by listening, you're joining the extended family of Lifetime Guarantee. Two things before we begin. First, after you've listened to this teaching, we encourage you to share this MP3 with your friends. Second, your financial contribution will assist us in making more of the ministry available to others. This is so important. You can make a donation at Lifetime.org. That's Lifetime.org. You know, I think the most important factor is knowing this God, as we've said before, and always deciding in His favor. Mm. Let me illustrate. Uh, Now, the point being that what we think God would like for us to do should never be substituted for what we know he wants us to do if we're going to walk in his will, if we're going to decide in his favor. So let me give this illustration. Little Betty's uh, mom, say, took in sewing to help make ends meet, and still their finances were pretty bleak. And then a letter came telling them that uh, Darlene, Betty's only aunt, was coming for a visit. Well, now's the time to dig into the sewing fund so that Aunt Darlene will really have a good time. So the house was spick and span, and the menus were made in minute detail. No fluff anywhere that could be cut. Now, it's Betty's chore to go to Mr. Carey's corner store in their little town and get everything for supper. Now, you can be sure that she had a carefully itemized list, right? But when she rounded the corner to the grocery store, she stopped and just amazed and looked at the potted plants that had just come in on the truck. Oh, she loved pretty flowers, and she knew that her mother loved them too. So this was her thinking. I just know mother would love to have a pretty plant for the house when Aunt Darlene comes. And so she deleted some of the necessary items and went home, lovingly presented the plant to her mother, and then was disappointed when her mother wasn't pleased Mm -hmm. with what she'd done. Now, this wasn't an act of selfishness on Betty's part. It was just an act of disobedience, Mm -hmm. doing what she thought her mother would like for her to do instead of what she had been told to do, what she knew her mother wanted to do. Yeah, and in that case... Why, it turned out to be a detrimental to mother's plans. Right. Apply that now to our relationship with God as we're talking mm. about God's will. I guess I just did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let me just repeat what you said. What we think God would like for us to do should never be substituted for what we know that he wants us to do if we're really going to walk in his will. Knowing God and knowing what he wants will protect me from stepping outside of his will. But look, it also gives me the opportunity to do those things that I know are pleasing to him. Right. You know, go on a step beyond just uh, simple instructions. Just because you know him. Yeah. So let me illustrate that now. Here's another story about a child or a person who was instructed to do a certain thing but did it a little bit differently. Um, let's call him Bobby, and he's just come in from playing ball or whatever. And uh, when he passes through the kitchen, his mom says, Hey, Bob, would you please carry out the trash for me before supper? And so Bobby picks up the trash. Now, he knows that supper's just about ready, right? Mm-hmm. And he heads out to the back alley where you put the trash so that people can pick it up. But he doesn't come back, and he doesn't come back, and he doesn't come back. And his mom begins to get upset. You know, that boy knew that supper was just about ready. Where is he? I could have done that in half the time. If he's out there talking to somebody or playing catch with the neighbor boy, I am really going to be bent out of shape. And then about that time, Bobby comes back in. Where have you been? Well, Mom, there was a dog that had gotten into the trash out there and scattered it in the alley. And uh, I knew you'd want me to pick it up and put it in the barrel, so I've just been doing that. <laughs> Utter shock. Yeah, I mean, her, her big problem be getting over the shock. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> but here's a case now where this kid knew his mom, and he knew what she would want. So he not only carried out her direct will to him, he picked up the trash, but he went way beyond that and did something that he knew that she would like. That's good. 
And you know, there are many, many biblical examples, let's call them testimonies, right. of people's lives where they have sought God's will and have obeyed God's will and so forth. Like, let's say Abraham, for example. He followed God's direct will. He obediently left everything, and he did just what God told him to do. He left his family, his homeland, and went out to a city that was a fantasy out there somewhere, you know, maybe as far as he was thinking about it as he was on the trail. But let me ask you a question. Did Abraham always perform according to God's will from that moment on? Let's call it the time he got saved, okay, when he stepped out and said, yes, I want to follow God. No, no, he blew it from time to time, and that's also recorded in the Bible. And I, for one, am really grateful that things like that are recorded in the Bible Mm -hmm. because we might have a tendency to um, maybe idolize people like this man thinking that they didn't have any faults. There's one person to idolize in Scripture, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. Well, take Abraham now. Uh, What about the episode with Hagar? God had given Abraham a promise, I'm going to give you a boy. And so God delayed and delayed and delayed. And finally, Sarah and Abraham and Hagar got their heads together and decided they'd come up with plan B, another way to help God out to bring about the promise that he had given to Abraham. And that was out of God's will. And we know that without question by the way that God responded to that situation. Letting Sarah mistreat Hagar like she did, uh, this was certainly not God's will for this man to allow that in his home. So you're saying that when God spoke to Abraham, he obeyed without hesitating. Mm -hmm. But Abraham didn't have the Ten Commandments. He didn't have the Bible to read. He did not have the indwelling Holy Spirit to guide him. So he veered off course from God's will. It's a miracle the man did as well as he did without all that you just Uh described. We have all of the above, and yet we blow it. That's right. So what's our excuse? Because we know God so much better than Abraham did. (laughs) That's right. Now, what was God's ultimate will for this man? That he be the father of Isaac, the son of promise. And Abraham fulfilled God's ultimate will for his life, being the first man of faith. The scriptures call him the father of our faith. That's right. Let's take another illustration from the scripture. How about Joseph? This is an entirely different story. In the life of Abraham, we see him making decisions that caused big problems. He wasn't boxed in by God. He wasn't imprisoned. He wasn't under the control of Pharaoh. He lived where he wanted to live. But look at Joseph now. Every episode in his life was planned to bring about God's will in his life. He was mistreated by his brothers. He was thrown into a well, sold into slavery, put into prison. And all of these things brought him to God's ultimate will for him. And that was being the leader of the nation of Egypt so that the chosen people would survive the period of drought. Now then, let me ask you, how would you have prepared Joseph for the task of being this ruler? How would you have transferred him from his uh, home to the palace? How would you have transformed him from an apparently rather tactless, um, spoiled, uh, egotistical young man into a compassionate ruler Uh, Where would you have put him for the training that he would need to carry out the ultimate plan for his life? What sort of experiences would you have prescribed for him to teach him these things, patience, submission to authority, how to resist temptation, all of these things? So you see, all of this was within God's will for Joseph. Joseph fulfilled God's will for his life. Mm -hmm. Now, do you see the difference in these two lives between Joseph and Abraham? God's ultimate goal for both men was reached, yet God worked in dramatically different ways, didn't he, to pull us off? Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, we mustn't limit God in carrying out his will in our lives. 
his ways are higher than our ways. We can't figure him out sometimes. In fact, most of the time, I shouldn't say that. A lot of times we can't. Uh -huh. But it's so liberating to know one thing, that he absolutely has your best interests at heart. Now, how can I know that? Because Jesus Christ was God in an earth suit who volunteered to come here just to rescue you and me from ourselves, from what we were doing to ourselves. My life and my family would be a mess if it hadn't been for Jesus Christ interceding and coming across. As my son says, walking across my lawn. Right. I love that uh -huh. statement. Uh -huh. Anybody, let alone God, who would do what Jesus Christ did for you isn't going to lead you into a path that is designed to destroy you. He agapes you. Remember the definition. I will do the most constructive, redemptive thing for you that I can think of. Now, does that mean you're going to have to go to prison or be sold into slavery like Joseph so that you can become everything that God wants you to be? Well, now, we can't know that. We can only know that he agapes us. He works for good. He works for what's best for me. Gideon put out a fleece, so does that mean that you ought to always put out a fleece? No. God is a God of variety. We can't box him in, just like Annabelle has been saying over there. There was a fella who, uh, a hypothetical fella who was um, hunting, I believe, out in West Texas somewhere, and he parked his car around behind an old abandoned farmhouse and was poking around out there, and he fell into a well. And uh, there wasn't anybody around for miles, and he tried to jump, and he tried to climb the walls, and they were too slick, and he hollered till he was hoarse. And finally, he said, I'm going to die. I am going to absolutely sit here and die. Nobody even knows where I am. My car is hidden from the road. And so he began to make deals with God. <laughs> and so finally, he just said, well, sir, I just give up. If I ever get out of here, you're going to be the one to do it. I can't. And miraculously, God, quote, just happened to have a man drive by and just happened to turn in and just happened to go around behind the house and saw this car parked, thought he heard a sound, went over to the well, pulled this guy up out of there. Now, the guy had promised God. He said, if you'll get me out of here, I will tell everybody in the world about your magnitude and your grace. And true to his word, he got in that car, and from that day on, he, wherever he went, he told that story. But the problem is that he went around pushing people into wells. <laughs> now, you just can't operate that way. God is a God of variety. Isn't Absolutely. It? And we don't always know, as you've said, what he's doing in our lives. Joseph didn't know what was happening in his life until the end of the story. And then you remember what he said to his brothers. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. But, you know, we know we're more like Joseph than Abraham. God has a plan for our lives, and he uses the circumstances of life to box us in, so to speak, to get us where we need to be in order to carry out his perfect will for our lives. You know, knowing God's ultimate plan for us as his children can ease the pressure of those unpleasant or even those tragic circumstances that come into our lives it can ease the tension between the people that perpetrate these circumstances who may indeed mean them for evil, but God means them for your good. God means for them to work toward his ultimate goal for you, for me. He has a goal for us as surely as he did for Abraham and Joseph. Mm -hmm. What is that goal, the ultimate will of God for your life? Well, to conform us to the image of Christ. And it said, and now why would he do that? So he can have an intimate, wonderful, one on one relationship with you and with me. Now, in uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, he says that he is going to take every circumstance in your life and he's going to use those circumstances to choreograph things so that you are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Let me read these for you now. And we know, that's not hope, we know 
that God causes everything, all things, to work together. What for? For good to those who love God. Now, is that you? It is if you're born again. To those who are called according to his purpose. Now, what's his purpose? For those he foreknew, he also predestined. That means it's going to happen to you to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And let me, let me add this one on to it. This is such a precious verse, Philippians 1, 6. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, of course, that's God, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He is going to carry out his will in this matter. And remember... God is not nearly as interested in what you do as how you do. That is right. What you do. That's right. Uh, you're a salesman, then allow Christ to live through you as you promote your product. Mm -hmm. That's right. You're a teacher, then allow Christ to be seen in you by your other teachers, your fellow teachers, and your kids, your students. Okay, say so you're a nurse, then allow Christ to touch to minister to your patients by your faith, not because they're pleasant to you, but because you are being conformed to his image through the circumstances of your life. And nursing is a vital part of your life. And you know, as I say that, that sounds just like play-like to me, like when I used to pretend I was Ginger Rogers and would dance on the front porch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's one truth that will be absolutely necessary for you to believe, so you'll know that it's not a play-like situation, and that is you have to accept the fact that Jesus Christ lives in you and longs to express life through you. So let's just pretend now. Let's say that a person lives inside you. Uh, this is kind of a Star Trek type story now, okay? Okay. And this person wants to control you. And he's a loud-mouthed individual, selfish, self-indulgent, profane, vulgar, tells dirty stories, has crude manners, he has a volatile temper, and, man, he fights at the drop of a hat. He curses and is just a really an offensive, boorish, unpleasant individual. Now, if he lives inside you and you're going to be under his control, he's, in other words, he's going to express that life through you, then what kind of person are you going to turn out to be? Pretty obnoxious. You're going to be conformed mm -hmm. to his image, right. aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. People, who, people will be around you and they'll say, you know, she acts just like the old so-and-so, right? She could be his brother. They're so much alike. Now, the reverse of this is what God wants for you and me. Jesus Christ lives inside you, and that's not a play like. That is for real, and he is your life, and that's not play like. That's for real. So what kind of person is Christ? Well, He's all these wonderful characteristics that the Bible speaks of when it talks about every person who is in Christ Jesus. So you see how vital it is for you to know Christ? Do you see that? Read the gospel, study him. And this time, don't study him to see what Jesus taught, but study him to see how he lived. How he lived. Study the God man, Jesus. Study Christ mm -hmm. himself. Say, Sir, I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to let you express your life, could we say lifestyle, through me. Oh, that is so right. And you know, as we study this God man, Jesus Christ, and how he responded, we are going to once again find out how we should respond and how we should react to the things that come into our lives. By letting that same life be expressed mm -hmm. through us. You know, another area of our lives we can begin talking about because of a statement that Ken made the other morning when he came into work facetiously. But he came in and he said, boy, the Twins are sick again. Cameron was up all night. Dara's incapacitated with allergies. And he said, 
I'm going to spend some real downtime asking the Lord about my besetting sins. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when trials and tribulations come into our life, what is God's will there? And look, we are going to have trials and tribulations, aren't we? Yeah. You know, we like to find the positive promises of God, but there is a promise in John 16:33 that we really would not list under positive promises promises, maybe, where Jesus says, I have told you these things, that in me you may have perfect peace. Because in the world, you are going to have trials and tribulation, distress and frustration. He tells us that. Right. That's promised to us. Of course, he goes ahead to say, but be cheerful, be confident. Uh, and you want to say, are you kidding, Lord, if I'm going to have trials and tribulation, distress and frustration? But he goes ahead to say, I've overcome it. I've robbed it of power to harm you. But we do have these areas in our life, don't that's, we? That's true. And it certainly doesn't mean that I've got some kind of besetting sin, does no, it? No, no, not necessarily. Now, when those trials come, we've got instructions on how to act, how to walk when we're in this furnace of affliction, don't we? Yes. First Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In other words, Act right in your mess. Uh huh. And you remember in Ken's testimony, he said he just had a, this constant conversation going with God uh -huh. while he was going through this tribulation, this trial with his little baby, Kaylin. And, and we have come to understand that this is the normal Christian life, to just have this constant conversation going on in your thought life with God. That's called pray without ceasing. That's right. Let's look at another scripture that tells us how to face these trials and tribulations. Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15. What I want from you, and he's saying this is my will for you, is your true thanks. I want your promises fulfilled. I want you to trust me in your times of trouble. Why? So I can rescue you and you can give me glory. You can always know that you're walking in his will when you're going through difficult times if you follow the parameters set forth in the scriptures. Yeah. Now let's look at another area. Let's say that a disenchanted wife comes to you and she says, I've just got to find God's will for my marriage. What might you say to her? Well, I wouldn't be hateful at all, but I would say, well, I know God's will for your marriage. And then I would point out to her scriptures that tell how to set up a godly marriage. I would point to the scriptures that say that the husband needs praise, authority, and a physical relationship. I would show her what her needs are, how she needs tender, loving care and understanding, a husband who listens to her, holds her, and gives himself to her completely, not demanding his own way. Well, let's say that she says, well, I'm doing my part, but he refuses. Now, that doesn't negate the wife's part, does it? No. You know the will of God for you in your marriage. Your instructions are to be obedient and leave your spouse to God. But this is so difficult when you're talking about, as you say, disenchanted wife or husband. And you know you begin to wonder, did I choose the wrong one? Hey, you may never get an answer as to whether the mate you chose is God's perfect will for you. But once you have married, you certainly must walk in God's perfect will for you as a wife. That's right. Or as a husband. That's right. And now once you get married, then everything changes and you are now in God's perfect will. You now have God's perfect spouse for you, even if you chose the wrong one. Now that you're married, it's set in concrete, isn't it? So right. just throw away these thoughts that come, boy, I married the wrong one, etc. 
If you did, confess that all to God and then start moving forward in your marriage. Let's take our marriage, for example. Annabelle married an unbeliever. Now, she was innocent. She thought I was a Christian. After all, I'm a preacher's boy, right? right, right. I'm a, yeah, no, that ought to be saved, yeah. <laughs> But God has taken our marriage and made something beautiful out of it. So does that mean or does that give someone who's listening the idea that it's all right to marry an unbeliever? That no way. That God's eventually going to take it and make something beautiful out no of it? No way. Huh? That was strictly God's grace. We could show you a whole lineup of people who did the same thing Annabelle did, and their husbands aren't saved to this day. So it means that if you're married to an unbeliever, you keep seeking God. You keep praying for your spouse, asking God to have mercy on you for having been disobedient to his will by marrying an unbeliever. This isn't an irreparable sin, but the consequences may be pretty tough. And God didn't bring them on you. You brought them on yourself. That's right. But, you know, let me hasten to say, not that marrying a believer is going to mean guaranteed happiness. (laughs) (laughs) You mean you know Christians? (laughs) Hey, that flesh is always involved. That's right. You know, but there too, seek the Lord, stay open to him, pray. You know, we've lived long enough and ministered long enough to have heard some pretty miraculous stories. We really have, yeah. But you know, the first thing that we should do when someone asks us about finding the will of God for their life is to be sure that that person is a born-again believer, that that person is a Christian. Because in searching for the will of God, we've got to remember that if we are not alive to him, we can't hear him. That's right. Well, in fact, he's not talking to us except to try to lead us to Christ. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. He can't understand them because they're to be spiritually appraised. Now, that means analyzed. Mm -hmm. Let me repeat something. Only believers can know the will of God. And God is going to work only in the life of a believer. Let me use an example here of little Catherine. She lives next door to me, but she is not my child. She does not know anything about my desires, my likes and dislikes, my will, and I have no intention whatever of trying to get her to do the things that I would have a child of mine do. It's the very same way with God and his children. If we are not born again, if we are not his child, he's not going to be guiding us. God reveals his will to the lost person in only one way, by calling that lost person to himself. It says that God is not willing that any should perish. But once that decision is made to become his child, then we have a new purpose in life. That's right. And he writes his laws on our hearts and on our minds. Right. We long to please God. We want our lives to glorify God. Now, what's that mean? Bring honor to God by the way we live. We realize the road may not be an easy one, And we begin to see his will, not our own. And all of this is because a change has taken place inside us. That's right. You know, finding the will of God, remember, is not directing God into our plans, telling him how he can fit in with what we want him to do. It's surrendering our plans and yielding to his. Once again, let's bring in a child and how a parent will set parameters for that child. Now, the fact that your parents had parameters set for you means that the more important decisions have already been made. For instance, uh, you don't have to decide whether or not you can play in the street. You don't have to decide whether or not you can stand on the floor furnace. That's a big, loud no. Uh, You don't have to decide if you can play with guns, whether to go get the Lysol bottle and drink some Lysol, to use matches around the gasoline can. Those parameters 
have been set. And when they were set, those parameters freed you to concentrate on the decisions that you were allowed to make and to use that framework of parameters as a guideline to making other choices. Mm. You see, you were under parental authority, and that authority gave you freedom from heavy decisions, taught you about danger and, and foolish judgments. As an adult, we need exactly the same thing. That's right, and if we don't have that, we're going to be frustrated people. Yes. Yeah, God made us that way. Now, doing the will of God is not entering into some simple set of parameters and then doing what we please. No. It's a moment by moment allowing the Spirit of Christ to live through you to follow God's will. Russ Kelfer says that we're increasingly living in a world where nothing seems certain. Morality is said to be relative. Changing times call for changing standards, they say. And so all moral behavior is subject to personal interpretation. Hey, self is God in our world today. And where anything that makes you happy is acceptable, any standards by which man has operated in the past, they're passe, even if they're God standards. All these things are made to look comical. They're just emptiness, chaos. Our counseling offices are filled with frustrated, destroyed people. Now, why? Because they're operating without any kind of standards. Without any parameters. No parameters. Now, what's the problem? There are no longer considered to be any absolutes, any guidelines. As Annabelle just said, the parameters are gone. This is of the devil, gang. Now, once again, let's remind you about absolutes in searching for the will of God. Study the Scripture to find absolutes. Look for them. For example, God says, you shall not lie. Now, that's an absolute. So let's say you're in a job interview, and you pick up on the fact that this person who's interviewing you is lying to you. All right, now when you pick that up, that means that you're out of God's will in a situation like this if you plunge into it. That's an absolute for you. How about the absolute of unequal yoking? Would you be joining the Holy Spirit within you to a situation where you would be constantly harassed through evil, profanity, padding expense accounts, selling products that were misrepresented? You'd soon find out, wouldn't you, that it would be really unpalatable to you to be there. So Mm -hmm. it would be out of God's will for you to get into it in the first place. If you have to violate God's absolute or principle, then it's not God's will for you to do it. Let's look at another absolute. God's Word tells us that we are a temple of God. tells us that the Spirit of God dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now, what's the absolute? Well, your body houses the Spirit of God. This means that your body is the temple of God. Okay, so based on that absolute then, you can't make the decision to run from God because that's impossible. (laughs) He's in there with you. The psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Also, another factor based on that absolute is that God will never leave you or forsake you. He says that in his word. He is wherever you are. And another thing, you mustn't enter into an adulterous relationship. You mustn't commit adultery because according to 1 Corinthians 6.15, that would be taking the members of Christ, your body, and making them members of a harlot. And also, you mustn't enter into a relationship or a partner with an unbeliever. Don't force Jesus Christ within you into that kind of a relationship. That's working with the absolutes in Scripture. So you can readily see 
that the first thing to do in seeking God's will is to study the scriptures to be sure that you are within his revealed will for you. As we've said several times, it's futile to seek the will of God when you are walking in unconfessed sin, moral laxity, um, a complacency toward God, when you're walking with selfish desires, any of these things that are expressly forbidden in his word, these will keep you from learning the will of God. Mm. All right, so that'll give you the information you need biblically, right? That's paramount. Yeah. All right, now then, research. Research the job decision or the house decision, the person decision, uh, the car decision, new television, whatever. And after that is going to come the confirmation. And it's going to come through some various means. Number one, the counsel of godly people. Number two, the circumstances that come into your life and either seem to be opening the way or blocking the way. And then the most important of all, the peace of God within. The peace of God must be true to the character of God or it's just not God's peace, is it? No. Uh, Let me point out something on that number one, the counsel of godly men. Don't ask a lost person for advice. They can't give it to you from a proper perspective of God's will. They don't know it. Now, you could ask someone like that uh, to fix a dental problem for you or the carburetor on your automobile, right? Yes, But we're talking about seeking God's Uh will. And you could ask a person like that, uh, a person who's not a Christian, when you're doing your research about a job, but nothing else. You might ask, too, what can I do if my counsel is divided after I've talked to these godly men? Well, which counselors gave you absolutes from Scripture to back up their counsel? Using what you have learned on your own concerning the will of God, you can discern godly counsel. The circumstances could be the open or closed doors, which I was mentioning a minute ago, couldn't they? Now, remember, an open door just means that somebody arranged to have that door open. It could have been God, but it could have been Satan getting you to go along with how you feel or your circumstances rather than the clear word of God. So don't go with any door if it violates God's word, no matter how miraculously it opened up or no matter how firmly it was closed to you. Finding the will of God is based on your ability to allow the Spirit of God to reveal truth to you, truth from God. And only those who are walking with God have that ability, don't they? Yes. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 10 out of the living paraphrase says it this way. But we know about these things because God has sent his spirit to tell us. And his spirit searches out and shows us all of God's deepest secrets. Okay, we're running into the last uh, minutes now of our album here on God's will. Let's summarize the most important steps to finding the will of God. As you've already discerned as you've listened to us, And as Bill has said, there isn't any magic formula, but there are certain steps. So let's go over those steps once again. The number one that we'll start with is fact-finding. Now, Proverbs 16, 9 says that we should make plans, but we're counting on God to direct us as we do that. Proverbs 16, 1 says... We can make our plans, but the final outcome is in God's hands. We're talking about getting the facts. In um, Luke chapter 14, beginning with 28, For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and isn't able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel as to whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? 
or else while the other's still far away, he sends a delegation and asks terms of peace. Now, there's a smart man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's called the principle of preparation by informing yourself by information. You know, many believers, I would say, actually study the purchase of a new television or a CD player more thoroughly than they study a major life-changing decision. Mm. Perhaps they haven't been instructed, but they will many times decide by just saying, well, I feel like this is the right thing to do, or they'll say something like, well, God opened this door, or God closed this door. Hey, God is an organized person. Uh, remember all of the intricate details of building the ark. Mm, uh, and rem- the temple. Yes, and the temple. Remember how much time he spent in presenting the commandments and how he went through all of these illustrations. God is an organized person. Yeah. Okay, now secondly in summarizing, make a list of the pros and cons. A lot of us consider pros as something that would make us happy or better our lifestyle, you know, like a higher salary, more Mm -hmm. fringes or whatever, more perks, better chance for advancement. But the will of God is that that furthers the kingdom of God. That's right. So the pros would be those things that would appear to be likely to further the kingdom of God, further develop in you the very character of God, and be most likely to bring joy to the heart of God. All right. Let's deviate just a few minutes here from our summarizing and talking about pros and cons. Let's look at four pros from God's point of view, from God's perspective. Pro number one, will I be able to know him more completely? If the decision you're going to make means diminishing your walk with Christ even one tiny iota, be it by moral compromise, by wrong relationships, or even the absence of time to be with him, your decision is already made. You have one goal, and that is to come to know him in your life. Okay, let's say you're looking at a job opportunity and you think, man, that job is going to double my income. I'll have more money to give away. Well, now, it's good to be concerned Mm -hmm. with giving, very definitely. But God is more concerned with one thing, and that is that you know him, that you be conformed to his image. When you know him then giving things away is going to be just a natural consequence of your life because of knowing him. Okay. Now here's another pro on choosing the will of God. What choice will best allow God to conform me to the image of Christ? In other words, to form his character within me. So make a list of your character weaknesses as far as Christian character is concerned. And then ask yourself, now, which of these choices will best allow God to work in that particular area of my life? That sounds so hard to do, Mm. doesn't it? Mm. For instance, you, you think, well, I need patience. I'm really weak in patience. Well... Then how about then I'm making... going to become a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how about making the decision that will force you to be tested? You know, you were facetiously saying a kindergarten teacher, but that would really hone your patience. I'm it? telling you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, you know, James 1, 3 says that it is the testing of your faith that produces patience. Hmm. So let's say I've got trouble with submission to authority. Then when the boss is over-demanding or unfair, when he places undue responsibilities on me, then I need to check it out that maybe God is working on my weakness, submission to authority. Uh, Let's look at another pro. What choice will be best for the people I am responsible for my wife, my children, uh, my parents, the earthly commitments I have made that are eternally binding. 
if choosing this particular route would maybe decrease your effectiveness as a husband or a dad with your family in any way, then your decision's already made for you. God has made that for you in his word, hasn't Now, he? that is hard to do, isn't it? Yeah. To say, no, I am not going to take that job, even though it pays this much more, because it's going to take me away from my little boy every other weekend, and mm-hmm. I'm just not going to do that. Right. But the man who's seeking the will of God is going to make that decision, isn't he? Mm-hmm. All right, another pro, a priority for you in your decision. What choice will allow me to honor the commitments I've made to those to whom I'm responsible? If you left the job that you're in right now, have you honored the commitment that you made to your present employer? Would you be considered a man of integrity as you left, a man of loyalty? Now, those are pros that you've got to consider as you're seeking God's will. However, let me add this. There are certain employers that no matter what you do, if you resign to go to another job, they're going to badmouth you. Mm -hmm. You can't win with those people. So obviously, it's not God's will that you stay there till the retirement age. Mm -hmm. That's right. We we have to consider things like that as we're putting these out. Okay, let's go back to our summarizing now. Number one in our summarizing was to find the facts. Number two was to make a list of pros and cons with some pros that you probably hadn't thought about. Now then, summarizing number three, the Bible is the final authority. So you come to understand the mind of God by learning his absolutes and then immediately eliminate any decisions that would violate those absolutes. Yeah. God's omnipotent. He's infallible. He knows what's best for us, and he does not err. So I can trust him, and I reiterate, when I see what he has done for me through Jesus Christ, I choose to believe that he is totally good. Uh, Let's look at a couple of scriptures here. Isaiah 45, 9b and 10 says, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient days things not yet done, saying this, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish my good pleasure. And it's for man's best good, isn't it? Yes. Daniel 4, verses 34 and 35, I will bless the Most High and praise and honor him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, for he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What is this that you've done? (laughs) Uh, You see, credibility is the key issue in our witness with our sphere of influence, the people around us, do they get a clear and pure picture of the God that we present to them as we say to them, I am operating under God's will? Hey, the world is confused. They hear a message and they need what they hear. They long for what they hear. They long for love and forgiveness. They need strength. They need purpose. But sometimes when they observe us in action, it distorts God's image. And they say, if this is what you're presenting to me, I don't need it. Hmm. I remember, for example, one time I went to a man and I was the chairman of some kind of a situation. And I said to him, God told me that you were to be thus and so. In other words, he was to take this particular job. And uh, he looked back at me and he said, well, God didn't tell me that, you know. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and as I began to think about that, I, I shouldn't have come on like that to him because to come on to a person like that, God told me to do thus and so, and then that person can immediately discern, well, hey, 
that wasn't the will of God. God didn't tell that guy that. Then what does that do? That might just damage me and my witness in that man's eyes, but it also might damage God's reputation in that man's eyes. Oh, yes. And you know, today we really make the mistake of portraying God as the superintendent of some sort of a heavenly welfare program who's waiting to bail us out when we ask for a job Mm. or when we need some money or when a relationship goes wrong or when we're sick and we ask to get well. And then when it's not his will to do what we're proposing, or at least maybe not in the way that we're proposing, we try to explain for him. We make some off-the-wall excuse for him, and, and we communicate our praise the Lord anyway theology because we don't know what else to say. God has failed us, and we try to make excuses for him. And that distorts God's image. It damages God's reputation. You know, you that's an interesting statement. God has failed us. And this is the way a lot of people would look at it. I think about a person, for example, who loses his job and he's without work for nine months, even though he is really trying to find work. He's sending out resumes. He's praying, et cetera, et cetera. All right. He finally gets a job. All right. And uh, he really praises God and he knows this job came from God. Now, there are other people who would look at that whole situation and say, God failed him. God should have gotten him a job within two weeks or something like that. And maybe this man learned to know God, and maybe he was more rapidly conformed to the image of Christ during that nine months without work where he had no visible means of support than he would have been had he gotten a job immediately. God isn't bound to do anything that we choose, and everything that comes into our life comes in for one basic purpose, not to give us enjoyment, not maybe for us to use our talents or gifts, but to bring glory to God. We have to, therefore, when we're making any kind of decision, ask this basic question, which choice will bring the most glory to God? What choice will bring about his kingdom. You know, when we pray, we say, Thy will be done, thy kingdom come. Uh, What we're saying is this, Lord, I can't live my life, only you can. So you take my life and use it as you wish. You have my permission. I ask you to do this, for I ask that your will would be done, and I ask that your kingdom come. Yeah, now what does that mean? Well, when we use that kind of a terminology, we're saying that we want his rule in the hearts of men. We want to see that brought about. Let me share with you a verse that Jesus Christ used as he was winding up his life here on planet Earth, and he was talking to his father. In John 17, chapter 4, he makes this statement. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. Uh, Look at Paul as he was coming to his last days, 2 Timothy 4, 7. He says, The glorious fight that God gave me I have fought. The course I was set I have run, and I have kept the faith. Yet you could look at those two men, and you could argue the fact Were their lives successful? Yes, they were. Why? Because they had completed God's will in their lives. Yeah. Let's say that your Christian pilgrimage is like a cross-country trip. God gives you a map. There are areas that are blocked off where you definitely are not supposed to go, roads that he indicates are not there for you, right? They're not open to you. Now, if you don't read your map, then you can't blame God for the road that ends and detours and all that sort of stuff or where you fall off a cliff. If you don't like the route he's chosen and you take the one that looks better to you, then don't blame him for what happens to you. And, you know, picking up on that, you're going to hit some detours. That's right. You're going to come to some roadblocks. You're going to come to some very rough roads. And you begin to question 
God's choices. Yeah. Look at that map again. Are you sure we're going the right direction? But le- but those things are necessary. Yeah. Uh, but we think surely there is some other route we could have taken. Hey, but if he had shown you the detours, if he had shown you the roadblocks, the rough roads that were there at the very onset, would you have taken them? Mm, no. uh, but they were necessary for the trip. They were necessary that his will, that God's will, would be worked out in your life. It's crucial for us to remember that we can't do what he's asked us or planned for us to do in our strength. We have to appropriate Christ's strength in us and through us. God never intended for us to go it alone. So we're never by ourselves. I'm never without my guide. I'm never without somebody to talk to about this trip I'm on. And gang, he's not helping me in this trip. He's taking me on this trip. He's living his life through me. Psalm 25:10 says this, And when we obey him, when we walk in his will, every road he leads us on is fragrant with his loving kindness and his truth. Let's close out this teaching on God's will by paraphrasing that promise there. When you give yourself to the Lord, allowing Christ to live in and through you, expecting nothing in return, but having the heart of a servant, then he will be your constant, intimate companion. You hear that? A constant, intimate companion. You'll never be alone. And this is a companion who loves you more than you can comprehend. He loves you more than you love yourself. And he's the epitome of kindness. A companion who tells you the truth and interprets that truth for you. You'll walk together, exuding the lovely fragrance of Jesus Christ wherever he leads you on planet Earth. We hope you've been encouraged by the teaching ministry of Lifetime Guarantee. You can find similar resources, messages, and articles at lifetime.org. We have a wealth of information on marriage, parenting, depression, overeating, freedom and identity in Christ, as well as men's and women's issues. You'll find a complete catalog at lifetime.org. Two quick reminders before we conclude. Feel free to share this MP3 with others, especially those you know who might need it. Do so with our encouragement and blessing. And we would sincerely appreciate your financial assistance in making the ministry available to more people. Just go to lifetime.org, and you'll find a secure way to support Lifetime Guarantee on the homepage. And finally, we pray God's blessings for you.